This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So, thank you very much for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here. And this um, is a paper which is based on uh, some of my research, which I carried out at the British School at Rome as an archive. And the, um, the photographs that you will see are part of the collection put together by uh, Thomas Ashby, who was a photographer at the, um, um, well, who lived in Rome and was the director of the British School at Rome. Now, uh, last year, um, they, dis- with very limited funding, they were able to put together a very small exhibition of very few um, photographs, which I wanted to show you just to get you into the mood, and this is why. I was going to show you this clip, and then I will I will tell you more about the background because Ashby with Trevelyan were involved in this experiment of um, transnational humanitarian aid. Okay, so let's see if we can show you this first. Okay. Okay. So this is the headquarters of Villa Trento that I will be telling you about. And these are the Italian wounded soldiers who were assisted by the British volunteers. And these are the British um, VADs and um, meeting up with Italian soldiers. Thomas Ashby and the photographer. Okay, now I think we can uh, oh, uh, oh, see that again. Okay. Yes, we could have it like that's great, thank you very much. Oops. Yeah? I think that's it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Ready to go. <laughs> so, um, hopefully that will have given you a flavour of uh, what I will be talking about today. And I'll give you a little bit of um, um, historiographical context where my research sits in. And um, um, So, uh, as far as the vanguard of international scholarship, it has recently been concerned and focused on the history of human rights organizations, the history of humanitarian aid and relief, and the history of it, the internationalist activism. It has opened up the new field of transnational studies to new topics of inquiry. More recently, in April 2014, the journal First World War Studies published, published in a special issue entitled Humanitarianism in the Era of the First World War, uh, in which Brandon Little identified an array of practices and humanitarian identities, which in the case studies he reviewed were united by a common denominator, American humanitarian leadership. 
building on this nationally inflected perspective and at the same time going beyond the American focus, this analysis of the early experiment of the first British Red Cross Ambulance Unit for Italy in 1915 provides an opportunity for reflection on the peculiarly Edwardian identity of this humanitarian initiative. It is argued that the combination of the agents' and national traits and their intellectual background provided the catalyst for this timely and in more ways than one significantly humanitarian intervention in the Italian Northeast Front. The choice to focus on the role played by humanities activists in the context of international humanitarian engagement also locates this paper within the opening up of a separate field of inquiry connected with the debate on the value of the humanities in civil society. The aim of this paper is to take a historical perspective on the civic engagement of a group of British volunteer active, volunteers active on the Italian front between 1915 and 1918, highlighting how the main expedition leaders and many of those involved in the humanitarian operations were motivated, inspired and galvanized by their professional association to the humanities. In the context of the First World War, this was not unusual. As I have argued elsewhere, in 1914, Edwardian librarians, scholars and adult education teachers felt the need to engage with the war crisis and demonstrate that their intellectual uh, expertise empowered them to make a unique contribution, um, either by providing British common soldiers with spiritual ammunition <coughs> through the organisation of book dispatches and war libraries, or by volunteering to hold lectures at the front. Set in the wider landscape of Edwardian men of letters, civic engagement and volunteerism during the First World War, this case study analyzes the contribution which some humanities activists felt that they could make once Italy entered the war in 1915. These were men and women who, in line with an established British tradition of Italophilia, were knowledgeable of the Italian language, Italy's ancient and recent history, its art and culture. So this paper analyzes the transnational humanitarian commitment of Edwardian uh, humanities activists who chose to travel to Italy in order to assist Italian wounded soldiers. Other British humanities activists devoted their efforts to support intellectually and morally boost either British soldiers or English-speaking soldiers and the members of the British Expeditionary Forces, taking into account the self-assured confidence which led Edwardian human humanities activists to believe that they too had a stake in ensuring the victorious outcome of the war, this paper analyzes what may be defined as the intellectually induced catalyst for transnational humanitarian interventionism on the Italian front. The push and pull factor which drew humanities activists to volunteer their agency at a transnational level were necessarily influenced by the intellectual background of the agents. The question which will be analysed, therefore, is how knowledge and commitment to the humanities coloured the choice of these volunteers' geographical destination. Italy, rather than another war front, was linked to the agents' linguistic proficiency, historical understanding of Italy's recent and ancient past, as well as cultural and artistic appreciation of the country's heritage and sympathy for the Italians, who had only recently unified as a nation. The aim was to give support to the Italian wounded soldiers, Due to the fact that most Italian common soldiers were illiterate, the kind of support that these Edwardian humanities activists could lend rarely entailed providing literary material or holding lectures, something which was reserved for the Italian officers and later for the British soldiers stationed in Italy. In other words, however, the Italian wounded soldiers who convalesced uh, in the British headquarters, experienced a culture of volunteering and caring, which, in the light of the Edwardian debate on the value of the humanities in society and war, had peculiarly British traits. The leading organiser, G.M. Trevelyan, as historian of Italy, was emotionally drawn towards assisting the Italians in what might for them um, uh, be regarded as the last war of the Risorgimento the national movement for unification. While he was very wary of the potential pitfalls that claims of the so-called unredeemed territory involved, these were the Slovenia and Dalmatia territory in, on the Adriatic, he was enthralled by the news of the glorious May days in 1915, 
which he described emphatically in his book Scenes from Italy's War. The somewhat unusual proposal which Trevelyan outlined to the Italian Under Secretary of War in Rome in July 1915, the involvement of a group of British Italophiles and medics in what was still considered by the Italian as their war, found the consensus and support of the Italian Ministry of War, aided by the congeniality of the British historian whose encounters with the Italian military authorities often centred on the shared pride in Garibaldi's triumphs. Determined to support the Italian in the war, Trevelyan was able to muster sufficient support from similarly minded colleagues and friends prepared to travel to the Italian war zone. The first British Red Cross unit, as the organisation was later named, was financed and administered in London by the British Committee in Aid of the Italian Wounded, chaired by E. H. Gilpin, but operated under the British Red Cross and its Chief Commissioner, Lord Monson. Amongst the fundraisers of the unit were two ex Garibaldians, Colonel Byrne and Cavaliere Ricci, as well as J. Allen Baker, MP. His firm, Joseph Baker and Son, made the main <coughs> financial contribution. In, o- in August 1915, the first ambulance unit was established. By the end of the war, there would be five British ambulance units offered to the Italian government, each of which was a separate, separate body with its own organization and field of labor. Trevelyan's pioneering unit was originally composed of 26 cars shipped from Southampton to Le Havre and then driven to the Italian border town of Modane, which they reached by the end of August. The unit was the brainchild of a distinguished gathering which had first promoted the initiative at the home of Sir George and Lady Young in Cookham. The leading volunteers were represented, well represented the British intellectual and artistic elite which had gained a solid classical education in public schools and in the old University of Cambridge and Oxford. Amongst them, Trevelyan was also familiar with the university extension movement. Many of them knew Italy, either due to their travels or to their residency in the country. Leaving Turin, the cars reached by train Udine, the Italian general headquarters. The unit was then attached to the 6th Army Corps, stationed in the area of Gorizia. Located halfway between Udine and Gorizia, the headquarters of the first unit, Villa Trento, was both a clearing station and stationary hospital. Ambulances in 1915 regularly travelled from Villa Trento to the forward outstation of Quisca near Monte San Botino and Vipulzano. Already in 1915, the hospital, originally set up with 25 beds, received a thousand cases a week. By 1916, Villa Trento had grown into a field hospital of 180 beds. It remained the headquarters of the unit until this was forced to retreat in October 1917 in the dramatic sequence of events which followed the defeat of Caporetto. Trevelyan's companions predictably included a mottled group of doctors, nurses and drivers. Among the medics were Dr. Brock, the Italian-speaking medical officer in charge, who had been physician to the Embassy of Rome, and here portrayed Sir Alexander Oxton, a well-known retired military surgeon who had operated in Serbia. Yet amongst Trevelyan's drivers and companions were, as Dr. Oxton observed, many talents, such as authors, poets, artists, musicians and singers. These included the archaeologist and photographer Thomas Ashby, director of the British School at Rome, the Slade sculptor F.W. Sargent, the young classicist R.A. Fell, later also a British School at Rome scholar, the art historian Roland Penrose, the Slade artist Henry Tonks, also from the British School at Rome, whose paintings, um, as this slide shows, will be portrayed um, would be portraying uh, horribly maimed uh, wounded soldiers. 
the young Freya Stark, the Italian-speaking explorer and travel writer who had studied history at the School of Oriental and African Studies and served as VAD nurse in the unit, and the architect Lion P. Session. Thomas uh, Ashby, in particular, was a close friend of Trevelyan, with whom he had cycled from Campania to Reggio Calabria in 1910 in order to photograph the sites of Garibaldi's liberation of the South in Trevelyan's Garibaldi's trilogy. The peculiar makeup of the unit was a trait which did not escape an observant visitor such as E.P. Lucas, the essayist, playwright, poet and humorous contributor of Punch, an autodidact Quaker who in 1916 travelled to Italy to visit the operations of the British Red Cross. The remarks noted by this unusual war reporter indicated that, mission aside, E.P. Lucas had the sensitivity and disposition of many educated travellers to Italy who traditionally enjoyed the atmosphere offered by this favoured destination. Under the circumstances, the itinerary offered to reach, to reach the action was an off-the-beaten track run tour experience where the attractions of Udine, its arcaded streets, and its castello, as well as the campanile of Aquileia, were noted against the unfamiliar landscape of the Carso and the Black Mountains. Yet the myriad of soldiers amongst the arches of Udine constituted a stark reminder of the purpose of the journey. Lucas first visited Trevelyan's unit at Villa Trento, a spacious Italian country house, which was now a hospital under the British Red Cross. One of the questions which flitted across his mind and returned insistently as he surveyed the British volunteers of the unit in the great dining hall on his first evening was, what would everyone here be doing at this moment had this war never broken out? Clearly, what intrigued him most was not the background of the medics, who had simply transferred their skills and expertise to a different spot, but the helpers. Immediately he observed, one of the busiest of the officers at Villa Trento is Dr. Thomas Ashby, who normally a scholar and an archaeologist and the head of the British school at Rome, now thinks only in terms of clothes, beddings and stores. Geoffrey Young, in charge of the ambulances, was described as a quiet, resourceful man of culture, well known in the playground of Europe as a climber, and the author of a volume of poems which were greatly prized. Francis William Sargent, originally with the Unit 1 and subsequently put in charge of Unit at Tommezzo, was described as a sculptor with a studio in Florence. Once post posted at Tommezzo, he had employed his spare time to model the figure of a bomb thrower, which Lucas, noted, cast in cement, has now a place of honour in the motor park of the garrison, as a visible token of the bond existing between the Italian army and the British Red Cross. Villa Trento included two wards within a converted granary, one of which, perhaps unsurprisingly named Garibaldi Ward, had red coats for all the men, a patriotic touch possibly intended to give heart to the wounded soldiers. Trevelyan's pervasive influence on the organisation would be felt throughout the hospital. As Lucas put it, on every hand is visible the influence of the watchful thought and idealism of the author of The Best Life of Garibaldi. Yet it was not only Trevelyan's scholarly interests which coloured the destination and the atmosphere of the British Red Cross unit, which he commanded, it was also his experience as a teacher. The following description by Lucas indicates how the atmosphere at Villa Trento was not unlike the fashionable common rooms in Edwardian institutions of adult learning, where Trevelyan had volunteered as a teacher. As Lucas' description warrants extended um, quotation, he, he mentioned, in the evening, when work is done, the villa turns into a social club. <coughs> Everyone assembles in a large salon, hung or rather plastered with unframed oil paintings. Here are sofas, a piano, English papers, and the works of Jack London, who seems to be the most popular writer wherever ambulances are driven. Conversation, which at meals has a way of reverting to carburetors and sparking plugs, here leaves those mysteries and takes a wider range. That Mr. Trevelyan would be a kind of natural selection, gather around him, sterling and independent characters was inevitable, inevitable, but I was not prepared for so vivid an interest in affairs as these earnest motorists now developed. Lucas pointedly observed, home politics and the war come of course first and remain last, but in the intervals I had with one of them an exciting talk on the works of Mr. Conrad, of whom neither of us can ever read enough. 
from another an English landscape artist in time of peace, I heard some vigorous opinions upon modern painting and painters. How charmingly these purely literary individuals, as Lucas referred to them, adapted their minds and thoughts to the practicalities of car maintenance was a peculiarity of Villa Trento unit. Most impressively, these volunteers had transported by the end of November 1916 115,000 wounded or sick men, covering short of 900,000 kilometers. The evening seances were therefore necessarily short affairs, as everyone needed to be up early the next day. Yet the clear impression remained that whenever drivers were off duty and resting in the common room, they would eagerly pick up either the Oxford Anthology of Italian Verse or the Manual of Italian Language. In Italy, behind the war zone, the fame of the Villa of Trento was spread far and wide by those who had been patient there. As Trevelyan indicated, the unusually high standard of comfort for the patients, which included the provision of hospital clothes, dressing gowns and warm clothes, was due to the exertions of the ladies' committees, a type of organisation which rested on the female tradition of well-established philanthropic practices on which British volunteerism during the First World War was able to draw. The practice of inviting the Italians to evaluate and endorse the activities promoted by the British was supported by the British authorities, who in the months prior to the entry of Italy into war had liaised with communities of British expatriates. Christina Long has highlighted how, following the outbreak of war in 1914, particularly in the rarefied intellectual milieu of Anglo-Florentine community, the British were keen to emphasise the bonds of classical civilization between Britain and Italy, from Roman Britain to Garibaldi, in order to emphasise the anti-German connotations of their allegiance. British positive attitudes towards the Italians were also encouraged in order to foster a sense of mutual understanding and shared belonging to a long tradition of civilization. The atmosphere of Villa Trento reflected this positive disposition towards the Italians, according to Dr. Oxton. The relations between the British and Italians were marked by sincere cordiality. The military organization of the Italian forces was praiseworthy. The spirit of the Italian peasants, soldiers, was gentlemanly and the endurance of the Italian patients admirable. Historians of Garibaldi have often noted how the qualities of the Italian hero, gentlemanly and humble-mannered as well as brave, were regarded by the British as being quintessentially English. Similarly, as Italy joined the war against the Germans, the qualities of her people were described in unusually familiar terms. According to Trevelyan, King Victor Emmanuel was quiet and shy with an English manner. And the soldiers found out that king, the king was a thorough democrat, both politically and humanly. According to Dr. Doxton, the quiet confidence of the Italian officers never failed, nor when there was a success to register, was there the least sign of bragging. Moreover, it was impossible to form other than a very high opinion of the Italian medical service, and there was a marked absence of the red tape. As the Italian newspapers reported, many of the British units spoke Italian, others French. Ashby and Trevelyan acted as translators and taught some Italian, especially in the early period. It cannot be underestimated how the linguistic abilities of the volunteers recruited at Villa Trento could have played a part in fostering transnational fellowship and mutual understanding. A list of medical and caring terms in English and Italian was compiled for the use of the less linguistically able members of staff. to turn the lights down because I can't see anything now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As Ashby uh, once put it, um, friendly contact with the Italian soldiers of all ranks was of the very essence of our plan. Trevelyan further contributed towards fostering bonds of sympathy with both the mil Italian military and civilians by lecturing on Garibaldi during the winter of 1916-1917. His lectures were addressed to the officers in Udine at the invitation of the Commando Supremo, as well as to the mixed audiences in Milan, Treviso and Trieste. In the early summer of 1917, the first British troops commanded by the Brigadier General Hamilton arrived in Italy. Fifty British Sikh were admitted to the Villa Trento in July, but the hospital generally continued to work for the Italians. 
It was on that occasion, however, that Trevelyan had the opportunity to note the stark differences between the Italian wounded soldiers and the wounded Tommies. What he particularly remarked upon was the convalescing Tommies' desire to read. Unlike with the Italian soldiers, everyone on that day was reading something, whether book or newspaper. British convalescent soldiers in Italy, however, who could count on other institutions, often supported by British expatriates, were not a priority for Trevelyan's unit, and Villa Trento continued to care for the increasing number of Italian casualties. While book reading was not one of the occupations able to entertain the often illiterate Italian soldiers convalescing, artistic and literary endeavours helped to raise morale of both the Italian soldiers and volunteers of Villa Trento. Geoffrey Young, who in 1917 lo lost a leg while um, um, working as a driver in service, had established a musical burlesque at the hospital, which was entirely written, composed and staged by individuals of the unit and was said to be remarkably clever. Moreover, according to Oxton, New Year evening was celebrated by dress ball in the men's barrack, where surprisingly wonderful costumes were turned out. Cowboys, Chinamen, Indians, a lady and gentleman in Highland costumes, and many others. Concerts were com performed in the wards for those confined in their beds. A Christmas um, pantomime and a presepio representing the nativity scene were also arranged. Other theatrical performances, including varieties and amusing monologues, were staged regularly at the headquarters of Villa Trento, in both outstations of Quisca and Di Pulzano. Recent studies on pantomimes, musical reviews and cross-dressing in, in the British Army hospitals during the First World War have highlighted how entertainment, dressing up culture and female impersonators created opportunities for crossing traditional gender boundaries and facilitating intensively close relationships. According to Anna Curden Coyne's research, on such occasions, hospital wards became sexually charged places and the boundaries of masculinity and male friendship were fluid, negotiable and <coughs> remarkably resilient. While the Edwardian accounts of life at Villa Trento suggest nothing but respectable relationships, the view <coughs> that a temporary carnivalesque culture took over, where the usual military medical power structure were briefly turned upside down, seems arguably applicable to the context of the British Red Cross unit stationed in Italy, particularly when it is taken into account that artists and creative professionals were well represented in their midst. Moreover, when drawing from their combined creative abilities, Trevelyan's unit of humanities activists displayed a distinguished self-mocking humour, which also transpired in the editorial of the first journal published at Villa Trento. Cultural historians focusing on Britain and the First World War have highlighted the role that generally humour and specifically war journals, <coughs> played in the context of boosting soldiers' morale. Unlike the war journals published for soldiers' consumptions at the Italian front, printed as an instrument for propaganda, British trend journals, often written by Tommies for Tommies, famously displayed amused irreverence towards authority and resolve, despite the hardship, to bring a smile on the lips of readers through verbal jests and cartoons. Responding to this peculiarly British hallmark of war journals, the Trento Journal and organ of the Anglo-Italian Nursing and Automobile Associations was erratically <coughs> published between March and July 1916. Mockingly referring to Villa Trento as the Grand Hotel des Anglais, which stands in its own extensive and well-kept grounds in a district well known for its bracing and salubrious atmosphere, Trevelyan added that the hotel was equipped with every convenience. He also highlighted the large saloon, which from the most costly fireworks are visible every evening, a clear reference to the nearby war theatre. After dinner, <coughs> he continued, the saloon is the centre of life, scandal and gaiety. Special visits to the trenches for hotel visitors were also highlighted, with reference to the outstations, Vipulzano was referred to as an Osteria and Hydro, 
which offered as one of its attractions mud baths and careful treatment for heart trouble and well, as well as daily shellings. Reporting the same conditions in more realistic terms in his own records, Trevelli had in fact noted in 1915 that Huisca and Vipulzano roads of the first winter were perhaps the worst ever plied by ambulances. Deep in slippery mud, they were, they were mountain roads with steep drops at the sides and sharp turns. Night driving without lights under conditions that such as these was a far greater strain than driving in Flanders mud, he wrote. Although the Trento Journal was clearly inspired by the customary humour of French literature, it also reflected the editorial policies of the well-established papers of the adult education movement, such as the Journal of the Working Men's College in London, an institute where uh, Trevelyan had taught. The journal was also the locus for uh, the announcement of prize winners of the month's great literary competition. The competition was intended as a source of amusement, as it was noted that there would be numerous porridge-fed poets amongst the contributors. The, form the format of literary competition was modelled on the blueprint of the activities held in adult education journals read by adult learners. In London, the Journal of the Working Men's College itself displayed great loyalty and affection towards the absent Trevelyan by occasionally reporting on the absent history teacher's exploits as leader of the ambulances in Italy. According to his daughter, Mrs. Mary Mormon, Trevelyan's decision to volunteer at the Working Men's College in 1912 had derived from his desire to unite the writing and teaching of history with democracy. Arguably, Trevelyan's decision to organize a unit which would deliver humanitarian aid to the Italian wounded soldiers responded to a similar impulse. In 1910, he had traveled around Italy to survey the loci of Garibaldi's liberation of Italy. In the following years, he had set out to write his trilogy on Italy's liberation and unification. With Italy's in entering the war on the side of the Allies, Trevelyan united his passion for the history of a people to the desire to deliver humanitarian aid. The humanities and humanitarian aid were inextricably linked, and it was in this connection the UNIT's transnational initiative should be read. Just as when still a young historian who had recently left Cambridge, Trevelyan had felt drawn towards an act of active citizenship by sharing his knowledge with the adult learners of the Working Men's College in London, and similarly, in 1915, his knowledge and understanding of Italy, its history, its language, and its people impelled him to organize and deliver humanitarian aid to Italian soldiers. Trevelyan and the other humanities activists experienced the full force of the war in the Northeastern Territories. In June 1916, Villa Trento had to deal with the casualties following the Austrian offensive, pushing Italian soldiers off the edge of the castle through the use of poison gas. Until the summer of 1917, the unit maintained its ambulances at Gorizia in Via Ponte Isonzo. Ashby worked as driver for the unit. This road gave him plenty of occasions to take photos of the Italians' lives as the war unraveled. The civilians' living amongst the ruins, such as the school run against all odds by an Ursuline nun in Gorizia, uh, portrayed on a derelict background. The soldiers, gar the soldiers gathering round the Casa del Soldato at the uh, Val Cosbana, but also the beauty of the surrounding rural landscape, which had miraculously escaped the ravage, such as the barn of Col di Vescovo west of Aquileia. Ashby also continued recording the caring activities of Villa, at Villa Trento, the feeding of soldiers by the VAD nurses, and the images of the wounded they are gathered. Trevelyan's unit were not the only British volunteers in the area. Not far from Villa Trento, at the railheads of San Giovanni di uh, San Manzano and Cervignano on the Isonzo front, a band of English ladies headed by Mrs. Henry Watkins 
organized canteens in order to feed the wounded soldiers who were being carried by train from the front to the major hospital centers. Although Mrs. Watkins worked independently as she was not associated with the Red Cross and had a mission of her own, she had good relations with the Italian army and with Trevelyan's unit, where she was friendly with one of the VAD nurses, Teresa Hulten, who had grown up in Venice and was later to become Lady Berwick, living on the um, Athenian estate. The photo of um, Mrs. Watkins looking around uh, the Casa del Soldato. According to Trevelyan, Mrs. Watkins had been one of the main inspirers of the local Casa del Soldato, the recreation huts for Italian soldiers, which were set up in various localities from 1917. Having worked previously in France, where the YMCA huts were known to provide a home-from-home -home environment for soldiers, which included war libraries and the provision of common rooms, Mrs. Watkins was well placed to provide guidance and suggestions for these recreational institutions, which were backed by the Italian chaplain Giovanni Minozzi. The interests for the recreational needs of Italian soldiers reflected the sensitivity to soldiers' well-being, which had become manifest in Britain since the early months of the war in the autumn of 1914. It was then that the first books for war libraries had been organised and dispatched to the front. While caring for the recreational aspects of Italian soldiers' life may have appeared a minor concern, which went beyond the humanitarian relief of the British Red Cross units, Mrs Watkins was simply extending beyond the British Empire what had become a recognised important concern for the well-being of the British Expeditionary Forces. While we do not know enough about Mrs. Watkins' educational or indeed professional background, her own sensitivity to the power of art which impelled her to engage in her humanitarian effort should, I would argue, warrant her to the title of, of humanities activist. Indeed, um, when, when she was asked what had drawn her to engage with the needs of fighting men, and particularly the most vulnerable ones, she referred to what had been her inspiration for her action. In her eyes, what she called the symbol of this war was the pencil drawing of two clasped and pleading hands by the Northern Renaissance artist Albert Stuart. When in October of 1917, the Italians suffered the crushing defeat of Caporetto, the value of the humanitarian relief was once again starkly brought to the fore. Caporetto was a turning point also for Villa Trento, which had to be evacuated in the middle of the night by all the members of the British unit, who were partly disbanded. In London, the news of the displacement of train loads of Italian refugees forced to evacuate their homes on the plains of Friuli, as far as the River <coughs> Piave, impelled the Committee of British Italian League which had been established in July 1916 to set up an Italian Refugees Relief Fund. Its honorary secretary was Mrs. Trevelyan. A total sum of £2,160 was subscribed, also due to the generous contributions of the provinces, Liverpool and Birmingham, where a fundraising lecture was held. In the latter part of 1918, when the displaced unit remained operational, Trevelyan and some of his remaining staff returned to Villa Trento, which they found ostensibly damaged by the Austrians. They continued to provide humanitarian relief in the weeks which followed the armistice between Austria and Italy on the 4th of November, as exhausted Italian prisoners returned. When the unit left at the end of December, it had carried 177 thousand sick and wounded, of which 40,000 were stretchers cases. Its cars had covered 1,319,000 um, and and kilometers. Trevelyan and Geoffrey Young returned to London, where Trevelyan set up the Villa Trento Circle of the British Italian League in 1920. Ashby remained in Italy. He had parted with the unit after Caporetto, when he had attached himself to the British Red Cross base at Genoa under Lord, Mo Lord Monson. After the armistice, he signed up to lecture to British troops in Italy, attaching himself to the education officer from January 1919. 
By this time, the educational branch of the British military was investing heavily in providing education to soldiers before the ranks were dismantled. As a humanities activist, Ashby still played an important role at a time when adult education and soldier education were highly valued in view of the work of reconstruction that lay ahead. From the early months of 1917, the Ministry of Reconstruction had started sending university lectures to France so that they could hold educational lectures for soldiers at the front in preparation of the task which lay ahead once peace had been secured. In the light of his interest in archaeology and ancient history, Ashby still had something to contribute to um, towards education and mutual understanding between Britain and Italy. He worked as a lecturer for a number of British brigades and divisions, lecturing on ancient Rome for the educational training scheme seven times a week, dividing his time between soldiers' clubs, stationing hospitals and YMCA camps. The announcement noted that as Ashby was one of the foremost archaeologists in Italy, this would be a rare opportunity to take advantages of the services of an expert guide. In January 1919, he lectured on ancient and modern Rome for the 23rd Division. He held lectures accompanied by lanterns um, in various places in the north of Italy, and he also taught Italian at the 7th Divisional Educational School in February 1919. To conclude, the engagement of humanities activists in the theatre of war, while on the surface not dissimilar to other humanitarian efforts which got underway in the following months, needs to be recognised and read it's in, the, in its own distinctive peculiarity. First of all, Trevelyan's unit was the first case of, of the British Red Cross unit which set off during the First World War to aid Italian soldiers. Its timely and welcome contribution constituted a vanguard post which rested on and benefited from the cultural, linguistic and historical knowledge which the humanities activists involved had previously acquired. It was this intellectual background which both inspired the leaders of the unit to act in, humanita in a humanitarian way and equipped them for the cultural transfers needed once they reached their destination. The Anglo-Italian perspective on this particular experience in humanitarian aid could draw on the long-standing British enthusiasm for the Italian's cause, which had been manifest during the Risorgimento years, finding expression in Garibaldi mania. Italophilia had been a trait of mid-Victorian Britain, and presidents in subscriptions for Italy were evocative of the commitment and sympathy for Italy of the previous generation. The success of the British voluntary model could build on the experience of the Victorian funding subscriptions, and the organization of ladies' committees, as well as on the more pervasive outpour of voluntary action which pervaded British society during the First World War. This cross-national bond of sympathy, as well as the knowledge of the Italian people, meant that Edwardian scholars, who confidently believed in the power of the humanities when organizing war libraries and lectures for their own soldiers at the front, did not hesitate to adapt their role to the needs of Italian soldiers and officers. Moreover, as the scholars returned from Italy, they did not only seek to maintain long-standing long amicable connections with the Italians, but turning to their own readers, they continued to disseminate knowledge of Italy amongst the new generations by writing and lecturing. Finally, having in their midst a photographer like Thomas Ashby meant that the images of war were lyrically immortalized by an English artist. His artistic sensitivity um, was um, able to portray the architectural artistic la and landmarks, whether unscathed or ravaged by destruction, the rural landscape occasionally laced by Roman aqueducts and ancient ruins, and the Italians themselves, captured in the social context of those years. Testimony to the value of all humanity activists in time of crisis, Ashby's photographic record of the first ambulance unit held at the British School at Rome now remains a little known and understudied treasure trail. Thank you. Thank you.